listen, look, and you'll see exactly what nature is trying to tell you. Hi, I'm Dr. Arland Hill, and welcome back out to Harvest Hills Ranch. And if you do look and listen in nature, it's amazing what nature will tell you. And what I'm gonna share with you today is what I've learned over the last couple of years looking at our pastures and looking at the feedback that nature is trying to give us and tell us about the nutrients in our soil. As you guys know, we're all about trying to drive nutrient-rich food. We take extra effort to make sure that we're doing that. And today I'm gonna to show you how we wrap that up and ultimately how we're gonna, what we're gonna do is look at what the plants are telling us, each individual plant. I'll go through some of these specifically here. And then we're also going to transition into collecting soil samples because we don't want to, we want to optimize the fertility here, but we don't want to guess at what we're doing with the fertility. And this is, this is the same strategy I use when I work with my patients in the clinic. When I need to make a nutritional recommendation with them, I listen to what input their body's giving me, I listen to the symptoms, I see the signs, and then we run a lab test to figure out exactly what recommend, nutritional recommendation needs to be made. That is exactly analogous to what we're doing out here at the ranch. We're looking at the land, we're seeing what feedback we're getting from the plants. What do those plants tell us about the, about the soil, what is present, what's absent, what type of activities going on in the soil, and then we're going to take a soil sample, send that to the lab, and get that information back, correlate that together, and figure out how we need to rectify any deficiencies or imbalances that we're seeing. So with that said, what I wanted to do is take you around and show you a couple of examples of things that we've learned and indicators that have told us it's time to take action and start looking at things we can do to shift the balance of nutrients in our soil. So conveniently, I've got a couple of examples right here together, and I'm gonna start off with the plant that, that started this whole conversation in my head, if you will, which is going to be broom's egg. Now, it didn't take me very long to do a little research online to figure out that broom's edge is a calcium deficiency. And interestingly enough with broom's edge, what you're gonna see is that the, the brown that you have here is just left over from last year, and then you've got new growth. There was quite a bit of this over behind me, but this new growth, even though it looks green and beautiful, the cows don't want this. It's tough, even in its younger stages like this, it's tough and it's fibrous and they just don't want this. Interestingly enough, when you look at Broom's Edge, Broom's Edge grows in very calcium poor soils. That's the reason we can use it as a good calcium indicator. And when we see the calcium levels come up in the soil, we don't see Broom's Edge start to proliferate. Interestingly enough, that also appears to be a universal theme that as, we've, as I've looked through and studied up on these plants and weeds, and I'm gonna use weeds in quotation marks depending on how you define a weed. Maybe it's not necessarily a weed, but I'm gonna show you a few other things here and you'll see that that theme of calcium deficiency persists. What I've got here is, is sorrel and we've got a literal just landscape of sorrel over here behind us. But interesting thing about sorrel, this is a plant that's high in oxalates and if you're not familiar with oxalates, these are compounds in plants that are not very easy to digest. Uh, I learned this the hard way when this plant was very young. We used to go out and pick it. We noticed that the cows would eat it and we would grab it when it was tender and utilize it in a salad or something of that nature, not eating very much of it. But I made the mistake of actually grabbing some of this when it got more mature and it caused a lot of GI distress for me. Not a fun experience. But what does this actually say? Well, there's a couple of things that Sorrel is telling us one thing is that, again, the calcium's low, but it also says that the decay process in the ground, meaning that as the carbon sources that get laid on the ground, as they start to break down, they need to stimulate the microbiota in the ground. And as a result of that, that allows for a better exchange of nutrients into the plant. All of that is not efficiently happening when you're seeing sorrel persist. Now, the other thing that this tells us is that there's likely some type of imbalance of some of the other uh, 
uh, what we would call cations, just simply positive elements, things like magnesium, sodium, potassium. There's going to be uh, there's going to be imbalances of those. So we're able to get a lot of information just simply by seeing the presence of sorrel and by having that large area of sorrel back here behind me, that tells me we've got quite a bit of work to do in that area specifically. Now, another plant that we have here is going to be thistle. Uh, this thistle has sharp, um, the leaves on it have sharp ends on it, hence the reason for the thistle is there's actually one of the leaves right there. And thistle is interesting because Thistle indicates that there's going to be low manganese in the soil. And the microbiota, they use the manganese, but they also transfer that into the plant. But it, when you have the, the thistle present, it just tells you that the manganese is inadequate. So right here together, we've got three key examples that we're using to read the soil and tell us what's going on. So now as we take that next step to go out and get the soil sample this is giving us at least some idea of what we're likely to see so we can correlate those results on the test with the actual field interpretation that we're looking at this is not the only information that we've been able to pick up and read let me let me take you around and I want to share a few other examples with you as well all right here's an area another area and this is going to be an example of a low fertility area now, if you're familiar with sand, one of the things that you might know about sand is that sand, it's crumbly. It doesn't hold a lot of nutrients in it. Uh, it has a very low uh, affinity for holding minerals in place to benefit the plants. And that's why one of the things that we want to try to do is build up some carbon material in the soil, uh, build up some humus if we can. And that way it gives those minerals something to bind to. It gives the bacteria a network to work within. And the other thing that's important to know about the, about the sandy area like this is that it does have low fertility uh, because of that, which is why we're trying to work on this. So you'll see even these pasture grasses, something like this bahia grass right here. Bahia grass is a fairly aggressive, resilient grass, pasture grass. And even in this area, it struggles to, to truly be productive simply because there's just not the availability of minerals in that area to pull into those plants and really get them to take off and to start growing efficiently. So this would be an example of low fertility and again, one of the things that was a red flag to us. Now, let's keep moving forward. I want to show you a, a few more examples that may be indications that soil testing is worth your time. All right, moving from the pastures into the garden, this is where the conversation around nutrient availability and what which nutrients are in the soil, what type of balance we have in the soil, probably connects most immediately with all of us. For you as our customers, we wanna make sure that we're making every effort we can to bring you nutrient-rich food. And here we are in the garden, so let's see what nature has told us about this. You'll notice that in each of these beds, we've got these beds composted, and in between the beds and these furrows, we have the pine straw in here. And what we noticed is that the, the transition point in here seemed to be a fairly consistent location for the weeds to start to develop. And it seemed like as we were trying to manage this, there were three that were probably more prolific by far than the others. And I wanted to go through these with you just to show you what each of these has said about us and might as well pick these out while we're here, right? The first one that we've got here, this is called Poor Joe, Poor Joe. All right, Poor Joe is going to be an indicator for low calcium, just like many of the other indicators that we've had, but this one can also be associated with low phosphorus as well. Now, it, remember balance is key in everything that we're talking about here and potassium and magnesium come into the conversation as well. And sometimes those can be high when this starts to proliferate. I'm gonna show you when we go back out to the pasture uh, in the last segment here, another indication for that imbalance between the calcium and the magnesium. Um, this can, lastly, a couple of other things about this is that sometimes this does indicate increases in selenium and sulfates as well, or sulfur. So that's going to be poor Joe. One of the, the second one that we noticed quite often was called purslane. This one's fairly small, thankfully. But with the purslane, 
Purslane is an indication about the pH in the soil. When the pH in the soil is balanced and the minerals that we've been talking about here have a direct influence on that, when the pH is balanced, purslane doesn't germinate. So the fact that this is even present out here in the garden tells us our pH isn't where we really want it to be at, that we've got some work that we need to do. Uh, another indication for low calcium, possibly low phosphorus. But this one also tells us some things about copper and iron possibly being too high. So again, this is where it's not just about isolated deficiency, start adding things in here. We need to figure out what our balance of these is so that way we can have a targeted intervention of what we're gonna to try to do. And then probably our biggest nemesis out here, scoot up here and grab an example on this. Our biggest nemesis out here has been crabgrass. Uh, you'll notice the root system on that crabgrass is trying to reach down, grab out on, uh, to grab a hold and grab some nutrients availability. But this was one of the first things that when we started looking into the garden and trying to figure out what was going out, on out here, the low calcium is a strong, this is a strong indicator for low calcium. It also says that the decay process is not turning over as quickly as it needs to be. And in part, I'll just show you why that might be is if I dig down just a little bit through this compost here, and you know, we've got a pretty thick layer of compost in there, but there's, if I pull that back, that's sand, right? And we talked a little bit earlier about the fertility in sand that it's just not as good as it needs to be. Interestingly enough, that does have nice moisture to it, and we haven't had a significant amount of rain lately. What we'll do is we'll just cover this back up, and as the years go forward, what we're trying to achieve here is that that layer of compost, carbon material gets thicker and thicker and we have a bigger, uh, more efficient base of holding on to these minerals. Now, lastly, let's go out to the, the pasture one more time, another pasture, another section of pasture, and I want to show you something about the calcium and magnesium that I mentioned a little bit earlier and a strong indication of some imbalances between those two nutrients. So let's head out there. The ground sure is hard. And this was another indication that something's just not right. This is a step in post. We Put our electric line through here and we have to put these in the ground take them in and out of the ground to run our electric fences our temporary fences and we noticed that as we were trying to do this there were certain areas here on the range that we just couldn't get these in and especially if we if it starts to dry out after a few days it's like trying to push these through concrete that's a problem and it's not like that everywhere it's only like that in a few areas some pastures are more problematic than others and what I, what I came to learn with this is that this has a lot to do with calcium and magnesium. The more magnesium that's present in the soil, the tighter the soil is going to, going to be. And if we want to loosen that soil up, we need to have more calcium availability. And so this is a strong indicator that we've got an imbalance between our calcium and our magnesium ratio and that this is another area that we need to put calcium down on. Uh, interestingly enough, one of the forages, one of the grasses that we use in the cool season that gets planted in the early fall is used uh, very lightly through the winter, but especially at the end of the winter, early spring is going to be annual ryegrass. And annual ryegrass can grow in, a, in an area that doesn't have a high fertility. And it's good, it, it really emphasizes the point that not everything that we think about is a weed is a problem plant because we actually use annual ryegrass fairly aggressively uh, during the cool season and the cows really like it and it does great it helps put weight on them uh, during that time frame but it doesn't take a lot of fertility to get annual ryegrass to grow either so a couple of examples here wanted to show you this uh, as we wrap this up and i've shown you these examples one of the things that i wanted to also do is show you how we're going to collect these soil samples. Fairly easy process, and I'll come back over, we'll go back over to the gate area over here, and I'll show you, lastly, how we do that. All right, lastly, we're gonna talk about the what we do with collecting the soil samples. This is a soil probe. 
there's all kind of variations on this. You can even just take a shovel and open the ground up and take a sample out. The only reason I like this is that it allows me to, to take a targeted sample. Uh, we're going to collect our samples at six inches, uh, the first six inches, and that's going to allow me to easily be able to track where that six inch mark is at to be able to collect a few different samples around the pasture and then mix those together and put that in, uh, in a container to be able to send over to the lab. So wanted to take the time to share this with you today. I, I really think that being able to understand, one, again, what nature is telling us, we should be able to, as we look at the land, we should be able to receive that feedback and make decisions around that. Um, it also gives us an idea of how productive we're being in the concept of regenerative agriculture. We wanna see that things are continuing to improve over time and think about what we can do to expedite that process as much as possible. So I appreciate you being uh, on with us today. I appreciate you taking the time to understand the correlation between the nutrients, the minerals in our soil and what that means to the health of the animals and to our health as humans in the end. And really appreciate you taking that time, guys. If you like the information, make sure you uh, hit it with a thumbs up and make sure if you uh, wanna see more content like this, subscribe to the channel. I'm gonna be bringing you another video once we get these soil samples in and get them to the lab. We're gonna go through and see exactly what those soil samples said, talk about why we selected certain tests that we did to assess those samples. So stay tuned, that's on the way for you. Take care guys, Dr. Arland Hill out at Harvest Hills Ranch. We'll see you in the future.